Ministerul Serviciilor de Intelligence incită constant curiozitatea. Informațiile sunt în general o marfă, dar pentru serviciile secrete sunt instrumente care le ajută să protejeze statele. Cine livrează informații Alianței Atlanticului de Nord? Cel puțin 80 de servicii de specialitate. Răspunsul l-am primit chiar de la cel care coordonează activitatea de inteligență a NATO și care îl consiliază și pe secretarul general. David Kettler este invitatul meu de astăzi. Sunt Cristina Cileacu, începe Pașaport Diplomatic. David Kettler, Assistant Secretary General for Intelligence and Security. Welcome to Diplomatic Passport. Well, thanks so much. I'm really delighted to have this time with you. We are at the NATO headquarters uh, talking about intelligence, and of course NATO means 31 uh, allies, and at least uh, 31 intelligence services providing information for the allies in order to, to have decisions. How is it like to work with such big amounts of information in this chain? It's an incredible experience because with 31 allies, let's say 32 soon, uh, we have more than 80 intelligence and security services within that construct. Uh, I often point out that I think the one of the big things that we discuss a lot is the political and military capabilities that the alliance has. We discuss a whole lot less in public the intelligence and security capabilities, I think for obvious reasons. But let me say here, when, when you have a, a network of 80 plus intelligence and security services that work with each other with trust and confidence in each other. I'm hard pressed to, to think of the question that could be posed that they can't answer you know, when they work together. And they do work together here in a way that is incredibly powerful. So for example, leadership in Romania is able not just to draw on the exceptional capabilities that Romania has, but also the capabilities of the other 31 allies in that. Uh, you get the best that they can provide in personnel and in information, uh, their insights, their views, the expertise that those people have built up, and it really does matter. I mean, we spent some time, 2019 timeframe, talking about the need to improve decision making in NATO. Uh, I had begun my work here actually in December of 2019, and this is one of the things we discussed and thought about very heavily among the leaders of the of the intelligence services. And the conclusion we drew was uh, intelligence and security are essential to better decision making. So we've worked this last uh, few years, I think, to great effect to be able to better coordinate with each other and to better contribute. And I think you see the payoff in the solidarity and in the coordinated actions and the strategic effect that the alliance is able to achieve um, through the contribution that intelligence and security are able to make to enrich the debate and then protect all of that uh, decision making that goes on. Well, you did mention Romania, so I'm quite sure that the Romanian public would like to know what Romania brings to the table. I mean, our delegation at NATO, what does in order to help this uh, enhance intelligence? Well, I'd say first thing is um, I've had close personal engagement with the directors of the Romanian intelligence and security services even before I took up the post um, in December of 2019. I visited Bucharest. I think on average uh, at least once a year in the four years I've been here, and they have come here also at least annually. So they have great personal contact. The second thing I would tell you is that uh, they have an exceptional grasp, not just on the situation that immediately occurs within and around Romania, but the broader region. They also understand Russia very well. Uh, they understand cyber and all the other transnational issues that we need to address together. Uh, and they have helped me uh, a great deal learn more, understand more, and as I travel, uh, for example, um, you know, I've done also a lot of work with Moldova in the time I've been here, and it's been very helpful um, to consult with Romania on um, what should be my understanding when I travel uh, and I go to Chisinau, who will I meet with, what should I expect. Now, I'm not Romanian. Uh, and I don't work for Romania, I work for NATO, so I have, uh, have to have a very broad perspective, but I'd also tell you I find, I find the contributions that Romania makes to be invaluable. And a lot of my immediate staff, actually, uh, some of my key uh, officers within my division are from the Romanian services, and they play very important roles within our intelligence and security effort. Well, 
this big amount of information as you said, uh, we, you work with uh, around 80 intelligence services from all over the uh, NATO alliance, require a huge amount of analysis to see what's uh, good information and what it's uh, less uh, good information. So what are the strengths and weaknesses of this system? I just touched very briefly on the reforms because, in fact, the post I'm in in this whole construct is fairly new in NATO terms. It's only been around since 2016 and I'm only the second Assistant Secretary General in this capacity. Uh, my predecessor uh, was a German diplomat. He retired last year, and his charge was, in fact, to create this and bring this thing into being. The fundamental issue that led Allied leaders to agree to this in Warsaw in 2016 was to try to better connect civilian and military intelligence and also to better connect intelligence and security. So one strength you have is the idea that there is a lot of compatibility and mutual work between intelligence and security uh, that needs to get done. The second is by creating an ASG post to be the strategic leader of this effort and provide that leadership um, and guidance and direction. You've elevated the prominence of both intelligence and security. Um, as, a, as an ASG, I'm a, I'm a senior advisor to the Secretary General, the Deputy Secretary General, I should say is also Romanian, right, and to the chair of the military commission or military committee. So um, you've got a tremendous amount of positional authority and an ability to really provide some, some very direct insights and advice based on that intelligence and security perspective. Um, the weaknesses are that you've got to first make sure that everybody's comfortable across those services with the security. Uh, sharing is a choice, and sharing entails some risks. Uh, in, in our business, we don't just share because we like each other. We share because there's some real reasons to do so. Work we intend to do together, problems we're trying to solve, and we have to have very high level of trust. So um, you have to really understand each other. You have to understand what the priorities are, the cultures and everything. And I'd say, just for me, I mean, a weakness of mine is uh, when I came in, you know, 31 allies. I mean, there were 28 when I started. Again, we're about to have 32. 80 intelligence and security services is a tremendous number. And, and I really had to get to know far better each of the nations, the services, the directors, the key personnel to understand their histories, to understand what they really care about and what it is they wish to accomplish. Um, and it can be a real challenge in that to try to get it done. But as I say, uh, there are far more strengths than there are weaknesses. Um, that diversity has a tremendous amount of power and capability uh, that the alliance benefits from. And how is the trust level um, on countries that have this narrative, more weapon leads to more war? This is something that Kremlin would say, but we hear this from NATO allies, uh, leaders. Are the information uh, offered by those services from those countries which are also allied uh, reliable? I think they are. Um, look, I would just remind, uh, we are politically aware in my business and politically savvy, but we are apolitical in the way that we do our work. We have to be. We have to be very clear-eyed. We have to be um, very distinct in the difference between what we know based on what we've come to understand and appreciate, what we judge, uh, and what we think about certain things. Uh, I have found uh, all of my colleagues to be, I mean, sincerely, the utmost professionals uh, in everything that they do. I, I meet with plenty of politicians across the alliance. You have to have that interaction, either for me to inform them or my staff or the services to inform them. Uh, and you do hear from them about what their views and priorities are. Uh, but we have to we have to do the right thing and stay um, in our own lane and on track. I, I would tell you what I've come to appreciate is that again, if you take 32 allies soon, uh, that's a pretty big family with 32 nations in it. So think like 32, 32 siblings coming to the table. I have three myself. Uh, we don't agree on everything, but we all love each other and we all share the same values. And I can tell you. Allies really gen genuinely have that same feeling and appreciation. You can have differences, uh, and you can not agree on everything, and you can have your own domestic issues, and you can have your national security issues that you work in this format. What I would point to, I think with great pride for the alliance, is the solidarity, the consistency, 
in the strategic communication, the clarity and firmness of our actions, and the strategic impact that that has led to in terms of security for our own citizens, the assistance to Ukraine, uh, and other partners in this. So, so I would say, judge us by what we do and what we accomplish, um, and maybe I just say, put a little less weight on when there are differences of, of view that come up in the beginning or even in the middle. Most of the European uh, Union countries, but also partners of NATO, expelled um, a lot of um, Russian spies, most of them with diplomatic uh, cover. But then again, uh, we all know that Russia is quite resourceful when it comes to spying. How much their presence on uh, our states, on the uh, NATO states, uh, influence the propaganda, the pro-Russian propaganda? These are things that they try to do. Um, no matter where they're posted, um, to include, frankly, back in Russia itself as well, because a lot of these things, cyber operations, disinformation operations, can be conducted from practically anywhere. Mm -hmm. But it is more useful, let's say, uh, to be in a location abroad for you to do the work. Uh, I think important to acknowledge right up front that these are, these are national decisions that are taken based upon national perspectives and laws. The consolidated actions, because you've also seen a lot of coordination and a lot of discussion about coordination, information exchange, um, a lot of work now to be sure that someone can't just go from place to place to place to place. Um, it's really important because that does put a, not just a tremendous amount of pressure on the Russian security services, but I think also really sets them back, and that's a good thing in this. I think uh, governments have become a lot more capable, as has this alliance, and our publics also, at understanding what's disinformation, what's misinformation, what's the truth, what's not the truth. Um, still very challenging, um, and we've got to strike the right balance between individual freedoms, especially freedom of speech and the freedom of, freedom of the press, but also at the same time to recognize that um, there is a world of difference between misinformation or someone just has the wrong idea about something or you've read a source that's just incorrect versus disinformation where someone is actually engaged in a hostile act to try to confuse you at best or at worst, um, deny you your rights as a citizen in your own country to vote properly or to cause unrest that could lead to real violence in our countries. And that's where, again, I think, I think we're doing a lot better in that regard. All these actions contribute uh, to reducing those threats and the risks that come from them. And uh, what do you do when it comes to officers from the allied uh, countries that are spying for Russia? Because there were cases, uh, not only Russians are spying for Russia. What is the damage control in this case? And these are things that the nations undertake. Um, we, ha we do have our own counterintelligence capabilities that also draw upon uh, contributions from the nations, personnel, information, etc. And there is a lot of crosstalk and, and coordination. I think one bit of good news is that uh, at least the numbers of these cases are very few um, and very damaging cases are extremely rare. But as you said, I mean, we have to acknowledge that they do occur and we watch for it. We have worked together across the alliance uh, to be sure that we have the right capabilities for counterintelligence and counterespionage, insider threat, cyber monitoring, all of these things. Um, and very important, as I say, um, that we do that because fundamentally we have to have the trust in our own systems and in our own people that our information is secure. The decisions we take can be protected. The actions can be, can be protected. Our people, information, and facilities have the necessary protection. So, uh, again, I can't go too deeply into it, but I just say to you, uh, this is an incredibly high priority for me as the ASG, for my deputy for security. Uh, and the NATO Office of Security as a whole, working in concert with the nations themselves. Intelligence analysis, in order to be um, accurate, needs a lot of detailed information, and that, of course, means, uh, again, a lot of work. How much is uh, this work done by technology at the level of NATO, and how much is done by people? We're trying to strike the right balance, and uh, we're trying to make sure that as technology advances, and we get more and more information that can come in that we are smarter at the way in which we receive it, process it, store it, handle it, sort it, and all these things. Um, artificial intelligence can be a huge help. Big data exploitation can be another huge help. Machine learning 
is another tool that we look at. So what I'd say is we rely on a few things. Uh, one is the training in the nations that is provided to the personnel before they come here to get them ready to expose them to these things. We have some cross-cutting efforts within the alliance that we focus on this as well. And uh, allies just agreed um, last year to create Diana, which mm -hmm. is a innovation accelerator for the alliance, and a trust fund with or an investment fund with more than one billion euros in it that will be spent over the next ten years on innovation to help fund some startups that could contribute to solve some of these things and that sort of thing. So I've said a lot, but I just wrap up on this answer by saying that that what I'm trying to do from an intelligence and security perspective is first ensure that we are able to give analysts the tools that they need to deal with this increasing volume of information so that humans can do the things that they need to do, which usually is around decision making and the critical thought, and to have the machine help them identify what information might be the most useful. From a security pr perspective, we have to be very careful to be sure that we know what these tools are, we know what the software is, we know who's written it, we know who has access to it and control, so that we're sure that we know where our information goes and how well it's protected and that sort of thing. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of work in this already and I think even more to come. You said earlier that uh, people learn to, uh, you know, to, to make better differences when it comes to disinformation and misinformation. Uh, but then again, at the level at European Union and also uh, in uh, your country, in the United States, uh, extremist uh, far-right uh, parties become the norm. How is this uh, seen from NATO as a threat, as a thing that happens? Well, I think there's two ways to look at it. I think one is the political question, uh, which I think is at least half, if not more, of, of what you're implying with the question. That's all domestic business. Those are sovereign issues within countries. I mean, you're going to have parties on the right, you're going to have parties on the left, you're going to have centrist parties. Um, that's going to be a domestic perspective about the way those politics come together. Sorry for interrupting, but yeah. if those parties uh, will come to power, uh, won't this affect the intelligence uh, work as well? Well, it could, but I go back to one of the answers I gave you earlier, which is to say that so far, uh, and I expect to continue in the future, that the contributions the services make are entirely professional and apolitical. We have plenty of discussions about context and about who thinks what and what the reasons are. But at the level of analysis and the contributions the nations make, it is very much in this apolitical mode and apolitical sense. I think for me the concern is not the politics, because I've already described the big family with 32 nations in it. It's if the politics translate into violence and extremism. And I don't mean among leaders. What I mean is if there's popular mm -hmm. politics that lead to violence, that is a concern. Um, allies care a great deal about terrorism. And in fact, if you look at the strategic concept, you'll see that we've identified terrorism as the most significant non-state threat to alliance security, with Russia as the corresponding one, as the main state actor threat. Within that definition of terrorism, we do look at things like um, politically motivated terrorist acts that could occur within allies. But we're very careful to draw a distinction between the things that they do as a domestic issue, domestic law enforcement, and so on, under their, their laws, Constitution, civil protections, and the things that they might seek from the alliance in terms of additional information, training, assistance, coordination. Those are all things that allies will discuss and decide, but the alliance does not get involved in the, in the domestic politics of any member. The last question is also about Romania. Recently, the chief of staff um, of our army said publicly that the Russians are jamming our uh, GPS uh, signals and communication of the, the naval traffic on the Danube and also the Black Sea. Usually, people are getting scared uh, when they hear information like this. And, of course, everyone knows Article 5 and jump quickly to conclusions. Is this a reason? to start the war? Well, there is a war right across the border, and I think that that's, that's why you're having this effect. Um, a bigger war. Jamming um, is something that there's no imaginary boundary between Romania and Ukraine that's going to magically stop the jamming from coming across the border. This is one of the things that, that we mean when we point out to Russia that they have to do more to prevent the spillover effects. Secondly, 
that they bear responsibility then if there are consequences. I mean, if that jamming, let's say, led to an accident that caused a death, um, that is their fault as a result of that jamming, whether they meant to affect Romania or not. The fact would be that there has been that effect. You also have a risk then of miscalculation, um, just as you do with drones that land in Romania or in Bulgaria or elsewhere around the region, Moldova and so on. These are things that we pay very particular attention to, Poland, I should say in this. Uh, these are discussions that allies have all the time uh, about what to do and what we need to be mindful of, and Romania has expressed herself here many times on this. Uh, we do have Article 5, as you've touched on, and you have heard allies say individually and as NATO that we are prepared to defend, I'd say an American, every square inch of allied territory. Romania is no exception to that. So uh, we see what the future holds. The, all the indicators are now that Russia has no intent to attack uh, the alliance, to include Romania, but nonetheless, these effects are still occurring. So. Uh, let's see where where things go in the coming weeks and months. David Kettler, thank you so much for this interview. Yeah, thanks again for the opportunity. I really appreciate it. Atât pentru astăzi, dar rămânem în continuare online pe pagina de Facebook a emisiunii și pe contul nostru de Twitter. Revenim cu subiecte noi din lumea diplomației și a politicii externe, vinerea viitoare de la 11.30 și reloare sâmbătă după miezul nopții. La revedere!